morning, everyone, or good afternoon, as the case may be. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this next installment of the online course, Organic Contaminants in the Subsurface. This lecture is focused on mathematical modeling of organic contaminants and subsurface remediation. My name is John Molson. I'm a professor and Canada Research Chair in Quantitative Hydrogeology of Fractured Porous Media at the Université Laval in Quebec City, Canada. I have listed my email and a couple of websites there. I invite you to contact me later if you have any questions. This talk is divided into five parts. This is the start of part one. So just a brief outline of where we're going today. I'll start with some fundamentals of mathematical modeling. What are the objectives of modeling? I'll introduce uh, some conceptual models for flow and transport and some solution methods. I'll start with groundwater flow modeling. Uh, even though this course and lecture is focused on transport, we need to spend a lot of time developing the conceptual flow model and the numerical flow model before we introduce our contaminants. So I'll look at how to solve for groundwater heads, velocities, look at, the, look at boundary conditions required for the flow model and some calibration methods. Then we'll move on to reactive transport modeling, including introducing some of the processes in a modeling context that you've already been exposed to, including advection, dispersion, absorption, and decay. But from a modeling context, how do we include these processes in a, in a groundwater model? We'll look at non aqueous phase liquid dissolution and multi-component biodegradation. We'll finish with some case studies on gasoline and diesel spills, as well as a case of enhanced hydrocarbon biodegradation in fractured rock. So what are our modeling objectives? What do we need to answer? What questions do we need to answer when we're developing a model? So most important use of a model is to obtain insight into complex processes. Another very useful application is to assess relative impacts or parameter sensitivity. So comparing one case to another, as well as looking at what parameters are most important to our system. What parameters do we need to measure most accurately in the field? Or what parameters are less important? Modeling is very good for determining worst case and what if scenarios. They're very good for making predictions, yes, but we shouldn't rely too heavily on absolute predictions from a model, but more in these other contexts of gaining insight and in a comparative uh, way. Some questions that can be addressed from models. Uh, for instance, what are the possible migration paths from source to receptor? What will be the possible impacts on water wells? What are the contaminant travel times? Are chemical or biological transformations important? And how effective will remediation be? So all these questions are, 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 can, be, can be addressed with modeling and in a relatively less expensive way than, than to go back to the field and do, do further tests. Modeling can be uh, very cost effective. So the final two ideas here are the importance of developing a good conceptual model for both flow and transport, and to acknowledge all assumptions and limitations. Modeling is never the real world. It's always a simplification of the real world, and we just need to acknowledge this, these simplifications. So just looking at uh, a conceptual model, in this case of a dense non-aqueous phase liquid, uh, so we see here a source zone at surface, and uh, this, in this case a denapple percolating through the unsaturated zone, uh, reaching the saturated zone and percolating down through these uh, heterogeneities and pooling, uh, forming residual phases at different different depths. Uh, we have many processes at work here in a typical scenario. We have a vapor phase, volatilization into the gas phase. We have dissolution of our denapple residual phase, dissolution into the aqueous phase. The aqueous phase uh, is governed by advection and dispersion by the background groundwater flow system. Many reactions can occur in this aqueous phase, including biodegradation. Um, so this, this shows a very complex system, and in, in the field, it will always be three-dimensional. Now, developing a conceptual model, we, need, we often need to simplify the system, or we, we need to simplify the system. So we don't need to include all these processes or the, all these dimensions. And the, the, the trick is to, to focus only on the processes that are critical to your specific case, and to simplify the dimensionality as much as possible. For instance, we don't often, we don't always need to include the unsaturated zone. If the unsaturated zone is fairly thin, or if our source reaches the water table fairly quickly, then we can just treat the saturated zone. And this, from a modeling perspective, can simplify our life quite a bit. Uh, we also don't necessarily need uh, the dimensionality. We can often assume uh, a 2D uh, or even a 1D system, uh, at least initially, to, to gain insight into what processes are important. Some of the concept some other conceptual model issues uh, here with respect to the flow system and the transport system. Uh, with regard to the flow system, uh, we need to address the scale and dimensionality. How, how big a domain do we need to, to, to look at and 
how many dimensions do we need to include? Uh, where will our boundaries be and what will the boundary conditions be for our system? The hydrostratigraphy, how many layers do we need to include? Do we need to include all the heterogeneity, all the heterogeneities in our system? For flow, do we, can we simulate a steady state system or do we need to simulate a fully transient system? Do we need the, the, the unsaturated zone or can we simplify it and just stay with the saturated zone? And sources or sinks, do we have wells in our system uh, uh, or, or surface water uh, boundaries, for instance? With regard to the transport system, we might have many phases, a liquid, gas, a napple, or residual phase. Do we need to include all these phases, or is there just one phase or two phases that, that are critical to our system? Can we simulate a single component, or do we need to simulate all components, for instance, in a mixture of gasoline? Do we need to simulate how many components of our gasoline do we need to simulate? This, these are very important conceptual questions that, that will have a, a huge impact on the on the um, the effort needed to simulate and, and the time required to develop the model. A source zone, how will we include our, our contaminants, either as a, a boundary condition or as an internal existing source, as a residual phase, for example? There are many ways to include our source. Uh, which processes do we need to include? Dissolution of a NAPL phase, adsorption and decay, for instance. Do we need to include the geochemistry, the background uh, interactions with, with, uh, with the um, solid mineralogy? Uh, and microbes. If we're looking at biodegradation, we need to we should include bi the microbial population. And between flow and transport, we need to look at the coupling. How do we couple these two? And there are various ways and various methods for coupling and uh, different different methodologies here. For instance, if we're looking at density dependence, for instance, if our if our flow system uh, depends on temperature or the concentrations, for instance, we need to, to include the flow system and the transport as a fully coupled system. Uh, the water or NAPL phase saturation will change the hydraulic conductivity. Do we need to include this, uh, this effect? Our, our reactions, um, they may be nonlinear, so we need to include that. So these are all questions we need to address in developing a conceptual model. Dimensionality is another big issue in modeling. Uh, basically, we have four different options here, a batch system. Uh, in this case, there's no dimensions. It's a, a batch. It's, at, it's uh, most likely going to be at equilibrium but there's no flow. Velocities are, are not important in this system. And we can simulate either a 1D, 2D, or 3D system, depending on, on different conditions in our system. Uh, and as we, look at, as we look further into numerical models, we'll look at uh, the grids. Um, and in general, when we resolve these systems, either in 1D, 2D, or 3D, we need to define parameters for each of the elements here. For instance, hydraulic conductivity, porosity, and velocities are usually defined by elements. And the unknowns, either the hydraulic heads, for instance, the concentrations or temperatures, will be defined at the node. So this is a common concept for, for all numerical models uh, in, in terms of a discretized system. Various solution methods that, we're look, that we'll look at or are possible. Analytical methods, um, these, are, these are only applicable really for linear systems and homogeneous systems and for simple geometry. For more complex geometry, we need to go to numerical methods, which will be the focus of this talk. And there are basically three, uh, three uh, methods that are used most commonly, finite difference, finite element, and control volume. And here's just a list of some example models that you might have heard of already. For instance, mod flow is one of the most common flow models coupled with the transport code and various other codes uh, available as well. For this talk, I'll be showing several examples with uh, sort of in-house built codes, FlowNet, TR2, Wattflow, and BioNapple. Um, Several of the several codes are, are freeware. They're available from the USGS uh, website. So starting off with initial and boundary conditions for our system, which is a, a common feature of, of any analytical or uh, numerical model. So the initial conditions are, are unknowns. The heads or concentrations must be defined at the initial time. And the boundary conditions are conditions imposed on the outer boundary. So whether it's 2D or 3D, we need to, or we need to define the conditions that are applied on the boundaries here. Uh, just a couple of notes on dimensionality. Here we see a, a drainage basin um, system for a flow, and uh, so so basically this this includes the whole watershed area. So we have a, say a no flow boundary across uh, the outer outer boundaries. We have some recharge on the top, um, and some outflow coming out, say, the river, the major river here. So we solve for, we're interested in solving for hydraulic heads, and eventually we need to get the velocities if we're interested in, in our contaminant transport system. And we might have some pumping wells here too. Uh, 
So this is a fully 3D approach, but this, as you can imagine, um, needs a lot of memory on our computer to solve, a lot of time to set up. So we often are interested in simplifying the system. And one, one way to simplify it is to just look at the 2D horizontal system. So we can develop a just a simplified 2D horizontal model in the XY plane. And this is applicable, for instance, if, if our aquifer is very thin and our, and our contaminants have dispersed already throughout the whole aquifer. For instance, a confined aquifer, a thin confined aquifer, this would work, or a, possibly a thin unconfined aquifer. And the advantage here is, uh, of course, less memory is required. It can be set up a lot faster. And we can also include pumping wells in, it, in a 2D plan view if they're fully screened, for instance. Another option is to simulate a 2D vertical model. And we'll see lots of examples of this today. In fact, this is a preferred, my preferred approach. Again, it's, it's uh, much simpler than a, than a fully 3D system. And it includes the vertical dimension, which turns out to be very important in contaminant transport modeling uh, as, you, as we need to reproduce these vertical gradients. And they'll only, they'll only be possible in a 2D uh, vertical system or, or a 3D model. And finally, actually, we can also simulate 1D systems. For instance, just vertical transport from a source zone in a recharge area flow will mostly be, be vertical. Or we can choose a flow line, say, along this flow path here shown in the figure. Uh, that could be a 1D system as well. So lots of ways to simplify the system, but you need to make a, a, a good choice here uh, depending on the, the physical conditions. So, so looking at uh, the, the development of, say, a 2D vertical model, we're in, we're, we want to solve for hydraulic heads, and then uh, using the gradients from the heads, we're interested in the velocities, because the velocities will eventually be trans, transported or, or transferred to the transport model, um, and will determine our behavior, the behavior of the, of the contaminants. So here in the, in the context of a vertical system, we want to solve for the hydraulic heads and the velocities here. So just thinking of this, this system here, one method to solve this is uh, using a flow net model. There are several, uh, several available. And here we're interested in solving for the hydraulic heads as well as the stream functions. And stream functions are, are a variable that, that will, that's, that's tangent everywhere to the, the flow line. So they, they follow the flow lines and there's some numerical advantages to solving for stream functions. Although they're only, uh, valid right now for a 2D, 2D vertical system, uh, not, in, not in 3D. So looking at some boundary conditions for our vertical uh, flow model, uh, first of all, the water table, if that forms part of our model, we can either fix the, fix the water table hydraulic heads here, that is fix the elevation, or we apply a, a, a type two boundary condition where we, where we know what the recharge is, we apply this, and this will turn out to be a much more uh, a much better approach solving for or applying a recharge boundary. Uh, we might have a, a, a natural symmetry divide here where this is say a divide between this drainage basin and, and a neighboring drainage basin. So across this boundary, there'd be no flow. So the flux here is zero. Uh, this, and this is the same effect as a symmetry boundary. On the bottom, we might, uh, well, it's often useful to, to choose an impermeable boundary, for instance, a, a, a clay layer or, a, or an unfractured rock. And again, here the boundary condition is a zero flux. And at, at the right boundary in this case, we might choose, uh, might be an outflow boundary where we, uh, where we have a known flux that's not zero, but we can impose a flux here, or we can impose, impose a hydraulic head, which will let our flow leave that domain. So again, we're interested in the hydraulic heads here uh, and eventually to calculate velocities, but we're, we're concentrating on the flow system to start. So just a summary of different of these different boundary conditions. We have this type one or Dirichlet, which is a fixed head. So here are just three examples of, of a configuration, possible configurations in a context of a 2D vertical model. So here we have some flow discharging to a river where we might fix the hydraulic head at this river or lake, for instance. Uh, even if, if the lake is there, we might have some underflow. So we, we can also fix the head along this vertical face. And we might have inflow along the upgradient face as well. This may not be a symmetry boundary as in these cases. So we can fix the hydraulic head too. And this type two, which we mentioned before, it's just zero flux uh, or, or, a, or an imposed flux. Uh, so here are three, three contexts for, a, for this type two or Neumann condition. So we're, we're imposing the flux here. And as we just saw recently, uh, we can oppose a zero flux along, say, a symmetry divide or an impermeable boundary or a vertical boundary here. This is, again, a symmetry, symmetry boundary coming up right up to the river. So this, in this case, this would assume that there's another basin just to the right where flow is coming up to the river. Uh, and the same boundary condition here, in this case, is applied to the water table. We have a known recharge flux across the water table, which would be equal to our precipitation minus our evapotranspiration. Here's just a couple of other examples. 
just different configurations here. We might have flux across the upgradient phase if this, not, if this is not a symmetry or a, a watershed divide. Flux of zero along the bottom up here. Or we might have flux actually across both vertical faces. So in some cases we have a choice. Uh, so some advantages or disadvantages between choosing fluxes and, and heads. Um, but they, they have to be physically realistic. There's actually a third type, which is a mixed type, which which, act, which depends both on the head and the flux. So in this case, uh, in this example, it's a head-dependent river uh, or a leaky river. So the flux basically across this across this uh, layer at the base of a river depends on the on the head on the relative head difference between the head in the aquifer and the head in the river. So you can have a gaining or a losing stream depending on this on this difference here. Um, and and you can depending on the position of this of the of the head in the aquifer, you can have a positive or negative flux coming up through this river. The main idea though is to use physically realistic boundaries or physically boundaries when it, physical boundaries whenever possible. That is, choose a, a watershed divide if it's possible if it's near enough to your system, or choose a river that's a physical boundary that that, that makes sense. We'll look at some other examples of when these when these uh, can't be chosen as physical boundaries. So here's an example of a vertical model um, developed and, and an example of, of calibrating to, to, uh, to a water table. So here we have a vertical system. We have uh, some discharge out the right boundary, a symmetry divide at the upgrading boundary, and no flow or clay layer or, or unfractured rock at the bottom. And we have some observation wells at various, showing various levels um, and some recharge across the top. And we define the, the conductivity and porosity, we might have some independent measurements of this. So the objective is to is to calibrate the system. We want to fit a water table to this, that is, fit, fit the hydraulic heads to the system. So first we, we solve uh, for the hydraulic heads and, and the flow lines or streamlines, if, if that's possible, if we have a flow net model. And, and we, get, we get this water table uh, here. And the idea is to match, or as closely as possible, the observed heads. And we can plot this on a calibration curve, just basically the observed heads versus the simulated heads. And the idea is to try to get as close a match as we can to these heads. Um, but one concept here, for instance, is that the system is non-unique. These heads will only depend on the ratio of this flux to this conductivity by Darcy's law. This gradient here is only really relative to the Q and the K. So unless we have uh, independent measurements and we know exactly what either the recharge or the conductivity is, it's really non-unique. We can this we can get the same solution for any ratio of Q to K. So to make this solution unique, the trick is to use some other data. Uh, in this case we can use the observed velocity or surface water discharge as a constraint. So let's say we know the velocity here of let's say six centimeters per day. That'll constrain our Q and our K. This will only work, we'll only get this velocity or this discharge and this water table at the same time for only a specific value of Q and a specific value of K. So there's our velocities, and this is what we're interested in trans transferring to our contaminant transport model. So just some other, some final ideas on concept of flow model calibration. Again, here's a, here's a case for a whole watershed study with, with thousands of, of data points, plotted observed heads versus simulated heads. We can calculate various measures of the error, the mean error, mean absolute error, or root mean squared error. And the idea is to, to minimize the standard deviation, and we can relate these errors to the standard deviation. deviation. So we want to vary the conductivity and the, the recharge to match these heads and velocities. Uh, but that's just looking at the flow. We re really should also include, if there's a, if there's a, contaminant plume already in our system, we should use we should use the plume as well. This tells us lots of information, for instance, the long-term information on the flow system. Uh, there's various methods that we can use to automate, auto, automatically calibrate the system, including a PEST code, which is available freeware, which you can couple with, with any existing model, and this will optimize the calibration. That is, it, it will choose the conductivity and the flux or what other, what other, what other parameters you have to calibrate to your system given some observed data. There are various reasons for uh, for this variation, so we, we may not always get a perfect fit. Some of this data may come from different times, for example, and if we're only simulating a steady state flow system, then we're gonna get some natural variation anyway, just because of seasonal variations. 
and there's there's errors in data collection and there's numerical errors too so all these have to be considered when we're interpreting the calibration curve I'll just finish this first lecture by by introducing one concept what we can use with what we can do with the velocities once calculated and the, and the most simple application of the velocities is in a particle tracking mode and this can be considered either either as a flow system as a, as a flow component or a transport component and in particle tracking we're interested in the in the track of a particle either a particle of water or a particle of, of non-reactive contaminant for instance through our velocity field and there are two steps to particle tracking uh, the first is a velocity interpolation so we've calculated the velocities say in this finite difference or finite volume approach just at the interfaces of our block cell here so but our particle could be anywhere so we need to interpolate these velocities anywhere within this domain and the finite element is very similar we have what say one velocity per element uh, as well as neighboring velocities we need to interpolate the velocity anywhere because the particle could be anywhere so that's the first stage is to interpolate and then the second is to displace the particle so we move the particle along its flow line along this interpolated velocity field in time uh, so we must calculate for each part each particle the position p as a function of velocity and time t so we're basically solving these this uh, advection equation just this displacement equation over time uh, here's an example of uh, of particle tracking in the concept of uh, or in the context of purge wells we have a contaminant source zone for instance and we have some purge wells so we'll just see if this is going to work we'll just click on here and we see these particles migrating to this these four purge wells and this can either be 3d or a 2d 2d plan view so particle tracking is very useful it gives us travel times uh, gives us travel directions uh, a lot of interpreted a lot of interpretation we can do with particle tracks Although, as we'll see, it only includes advection. It's only advective transport or advective movement of these particles. It doesn't include dispersion. And here's, a, finally, uh, an example of uh, an application of particle tracks. These are the 10-year particle tracks for the well fields in the city of Kitchener-Waterloo. Uh, so we've re what we've done is release particles at each of these wells, uh, and we can see their final tra trajectories after 10 years. This is in the context, context of water protection, but equally applicable is in the context of remediation if these if these would be pump purge wells for instance so this is very fast method particle tracking compared to uh, fully advective dispersive transport so this is a very very useful uh, very useful application of a flow model so with that I'll finish this first part of, of this five-part series and welcome you to uh, invite you to return for the second part in it thank you